all this fellowship. Good morning, church. Good morning. Great to be with you, whether you're at home online, um, which is the bane of my existence, or if you're here in person and you're not. Um, and I only say that because it's electronic stuff. Boy, I tell you what. Um, it's like other churches are doing the same thing at the same time. I don't know. I'm glad to be together to worship the Lord. That's why we're here. That's what it's all about. Amen? Amen. And if you are um, uh, in the least bit... I'm so glad there's some social distancing going on. I feel like our boat is leaning. Have you have you noticed any you know um, anxiety, stress this season? Reminds me of one. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a way for you to take care of that, at least for you guys and boys and girls. We have the annual turkey shoot coming. It's going to be Saturday, November 7th, uh, at the Rehart Farm and Range, I'm calling it. <clears throat> Every year I try to think of something. Anyway, there's an address up there. Vic uh, is sitting back here. We'd love to give you more information, but it's going to be so much fun. What do you mean? West. You know, one little thing. One little thing. You know, I send this stuff to you. I will get my secretary right on that. <laughs> We're going to have prizes as usual, and this year a raffle for a youth rifle, 22 caliber rifle. That'll be awesome if you have a, a 22 rifle, right? 22 rifles only. And if you have one and you'd like to bring it and use yours, that's great. We will have loaners if you don't have one. Again, this is for uh, uh, men, boys, and girls. We will have lunch, and everybody can participate by. Saving your pumpkins. What did you say? Save the pumpkins. Save the pumpkins. Okay, save your pumpkins and give them to us to blow up. <laughs> which is kind of what I was saying. You're feeling that anxiety, that stress? Let's blow some things up, which is always a good time. I was going to say recycle. Recycle. There you go. We're going to work. Yeah. We always have a good time. We always have a good time. Um, speaking of uh, the live stream, um, we are probably not going to continue to do Facebook. That's been the challenge. Uh, it's either Facebook or YouTube and uh, our website. So I think because of the challenges that we're going through, we're probably going to end up just doing YouTube and, and our, our website. So I'm sorry for all those who are on Facebook who like to, to add comments and all that. I will upload it later to Facebook, but um, to do a live stream, looks like we're going to end up in the future just going with YouTube and our website. Um, Offering boxes in back. If you didn't know about Tithely, we have an account there. And if you do go to our website, you can see there's a link there in order to, to give um, to that. Uh, of course, the ladies know about their, uh, I don't have the slide, but the ladies know about their uh, uh, Bible study that started last Wednesday. And I guess it's fantastic. I wouldn't know. I wasn't invited. <sighs> no, I'm just teasing. I'm, I'm glad that... Um, I'm glad that we're, we're having some opportunities to get together, and this is one of them. So I'm going to pray, and we can worship our Lord and, and see what he has for us in his word. God, thank you for caring for us in abundant ways as you have this season. Lord, there's been great challenge, and yet you are always faithful, always faithful to your word, always faithful to your children. And this morning, we gathered in your name, uh, whether we're at home and connected through uh, through uh, the internet, or whether we're, we're here and, uh, in person, God, we want you to be uh, our honored guest. We want your presence to touch our lives and change us from glory to glory, for it's you we've come to worship. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. <laughs> Oh good, the boat is bouncing. <laughs> Thanks guys. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
take me as you find me With all my fears and failures I'm filled Yeah. 
side of the parsonage, you haven't seen that Jay and Sean's house, old house is gone, and uh, it's, it's almost nearly ready for the new one to be brought in, 
just a few fi final touches that they need to do. Um, but yeah, it's uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, <laughs> you're not excited, are you? <laughs> Who else has a praise today? Lindsay. My dad is coming home in a week and a half from California. He's been working there for since the seventh of September. Wow. Of September. Oh, no, no longer than that. September. September seventh. Oh, this is October. <laughs> I was like this one. Yeah. So Lindsay was saying that her dad has been working down in the California fires, um, keep, keeping the stuff running and really generators and all that kind of stuff going and but he's got a week week and a half more and he gets to come home praise god but keep praying for the for the fires for those that are being affected for the first responders all of you who had to evacuate i know you feel deeply for for those who are going through it and are grateful for not protecting your homes Aren't you glad that God's got us and he has the last word? God's got us. God's got you. Take that in. God's got you. And he has the last word. That's, of course, the core message of the last book of the Bible uh, that we are exploring this season. If you missed the first three studies, um, you can catch up with the videos on our uh, website and, uh, or Facebook or YouTube. Last week we learned that Revelation uh, includes its own divine outline. Uh, Revelation 1 verse 19, Jesus told John to write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. So this is an outline of the entire book of Revelation. Write what you have seen. That's number one. Write what is now, and write what will take place later. John... Um, wrote what he had seen in chapter 1, uh, a vision of heaven and the resurrected Lord Jesus. Um, John wrote about what is now in chapters 2 and 3, uh, and that's referring to the season of the Christian church as represented by seven actual churches that Jesus has messages for. And again, that's in chapters 2 and 3. And what will come later, John wrote about that, in chapters 4 to the end of the book, chapter 22. These are things that have not happened yet, um, including the rapture of the church and the great tribulation, uh, the return of Jesus, and a new heaven and a new earth, eternal paradise. Who's ready? Who's ready for that eternal paradise? Amen. Last week we started into the second section, what is now, the seven messages for Jesus uh, that Jesus gave to uh, seven specific churches, a uh, church in Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, these are all uh, cities or towns, um, church in Pergamum, a, a church in Thyatira, uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Each of these churches were existing churches. I think I have a, oh, that was the next one. What is to come? There they are. Each of these churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, each of these were existing churches, real churches, that the Apostle John um, was the overseeing shepherd of. Um, so he had a relationship with all of them. They were all real, real churches, real issues that our chief shepherd wanted to address. So each message from Jesus is really like a report card uh, for each specific church uh, that happens to be helpful for all churches, including ours. As Jesus said over and over throughout Revelation, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen? Um, so let's let's open our ears and our hearts to what the Spirit says. Last Sunday we considered uh, the first message to the first church of Ephesus. Uh, and in short, that message was, don't neglect your first love. Don't forget your first love. The Ephesian Christians were a devoted bunch. They were dedicated to the truth. They resisted false teachers uh, and false teachings, uh, even in the face of persecution and suffering. We might even say they, they were religious, but they neglected the relationship. 
They were religious, but they neglected the relationship. They served the Lord, but forgot to delight in Him. And that's an important reminder for every church and for every Christian, isn't it? Now let's go ahead and take a look at the second uh, church. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and pray over the word this morning. Uh, Lord Jesus, this is your word, uh, written by your spirit through ordinary people um, that, that had became extraordinary because it's a living word, a word that you're going to illuminate, we pray, to us today. So I pray that this wouldn't be a message that I bring, a mess, but it'd be a message you bring by your spirit to each and every one uh, who, who goes through this study with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Smyrna, church number two. Let's see what's behind door number two. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 8 is where we're at, uh, which says, To the angel, which we learned was like the leader of the church or the pastor of the church, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and then who came back to life. So as before, we're not just given a name, but we're given a description of Jesus, the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, as it said uh, in other verses, uh, who died and came back to life again. Verse 9, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan a church of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Okay, let's unpack this a bit. The name Smyrna um, actually comes from the word myrrh. And you might recall that as one of the three gifts that the wise men brought to the baby Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold for, uh, represents his kingship. Uh, frankincense represents his priesthood. And myrrh is a spice used in burials. It's a burial spice. So along with being the king of kings and our high priest, Jesus is the lamb for sinners slain. But myrrh actually represents more than Jesus' death. The fragrance of myrrh is only released when it's crushed. The fragrance of myrrh is only released when it's crushed. You might recall Isaiah 53, 5 says, he, referring to Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. A sweet fragrance indeed. Here's another fun fact. Along with receiving myrrh as a gift, um, as a child, a soldier offered myrrh to, to Jesus on the cross to deaden his pain, uh, though Jesus had declined. Then on Easter Sunday, women brought myrrh and other burial spices to his tomb, but he wasn't there. He was risen. Amen. Isaiah also wrote about Christ's return, his second coming. Uh, verse Chapter 60, verse 6 says um, that the people of Sheba will bring gold and frankincense and will come worshiping the Lord. What's missing? Myrrh. They'll bring gold for the king and frankincense for the high priest when Jesus returns. But not myrrh because Jesus isn't coming back to die. He's, he's returning to have the last word. Amen? Okay, so the name Smyrna comes from myrrh, which was one of the city's main exports um, back then. In the first century, Smyrna was a trade center, a commerce center, a port city with two harbors. The city spread up the slopes of Mount Pagos uh, and crowned the impregnable fortress known as the Crown of Smyrna. It crowned the impregnable, think about that, just... Yeah, the crown of Smyrna, Smyrna was the impregnable fortress uh, that, that was there in Smyrna. In fact, the symbol of a crown came to represent the walled city of Smyrna. Uh, even its coins were minted with a crown. Uh, Smyrna was also a pagan city that worshipped a variety of, of deities, of idols. Some even say Smyrna was where the worship of Caesars began. So look again at Christ's message 
Oh, I had that one in there twice. How nice. Uh, in Revelation 2.9 again. Um, I know the afflictions of your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Uh, like Ephesus, Jesus knows. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we're uh, suffering. He sees our afflictions, not just Smyrna's, ours. He sees the challenges that, that Jay and Sean have had with their house. He sees the challenges that we've had with our health. He sees the challenges that we've had in our schools uh, as teachers, administrators, and as students. He sees what we're going through. Well, let that encourage you today. He knows. He's not some God out there who has no uh, connection. The Christians uh, in Smyrna suffered for their, for their faith. In their suffering, their crushing, a fragrance was released. We don't have to look far today to see how we might relate to the church in Smyrna, Smyrna do we? It's not fun to talk about, but uh, just looking around... Uh, not very far at all. Uh, the political battles in our government and in our media, uh, the unrest on the campuses in our country, the coordinated attacks on the street, the, simply remaining faithful is going to be tested in ways that we are not accustomed to as Christians. That's a reality. And by the way, in, um, in a month are the elections. And I know there are a lot of people who are saying, I'm just so fed up, the whole thing, I'm not even going to bother. Please vote. In fact, may I say it this way? If we don't vote, we don't have a right to, com to complain. Yeah. That's right. Okay? So please be a part of the process that we have. Um, God's kingdom may be a theocracy, but we still live in an American democracy and still have that... Christians around the world are actually watching what's going on here in America uh, and praying for us because they know what it's like to experience real persecution. They know what it's like to be thrown in jail just for their faith or, or to be, uh, have, the, have the testing of, of people wanting to sue you or do things to you, uh, take your business away, or all the things that we're starting to see. And only those who faithfully live in Jesus, empowered by his spirit and grounded in his word, will overcome like the believers in Smyrna did. See, out of the seven churches in Revelation, Smyrna was one of two. One of two to receive only positive words from Jesus. He had no critic negative criticism for them. For them, they weren't perfect. Christians in Smyrna, they weren't perfect. Yet Jesus was blessed by their faithfulness, whatever they faced. They lived in poverty. Yet Jesus called them rich. In a city symbolized by a crown, they lost a lot, even their lives. Yet a crown of life was waiting for them in heaven. Now, I put up here, verse 9, uh, a segment that I think is really rather interesting. It's, it's um, what does it mean? I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. You might recall that the Jewish leaders um, rejected Jesus as the Messiah. They once... Uh, actually had a, a, a conversation that adds light to this passage. It's back in the Gospel of John, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 39. Um, John, excuse me, Jesus is talking with the Jewish leaders. They said, our father is Abraham, they declared. No, Jesus replied, for if you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you are trying to kill me because I told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you are imitating your real father. And Jesus tells us who their real father was in verse 44. You are the children of your father, the devil. That's not something any of us want to hear. You are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of lies. Harsh, harsh words for the deceived. But then 
But then these weren't really true Jews. Uh, Romans 2 tells us what a true Jew is. A true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law, rather it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. The Jewish leaders really struggled because they wanted praise from people. Now just to be clear, Jesus didn't come to make us all Jewish. And that's not what I'm, I'm trying to get across here. He came to make us God's children. Before Jesus showed up to conquer sin and death 2,000 years ago, God's people were the Jews. But not by birth and not by obedience. They were God's children by faith. Just as Abraham was. They were God's children by a change of heart that worships the Lord above all else. That's also true for us. We aren't God's children by what we do or by where we're born. Um, maybe you were born in a Christian family like I was. Uh, maybe you were born on Sunday. Anybody born on Sunday? I was. I guess I'm special. <clears throat> that doesn't make me a Christian, does it? That doesn't open heaven's door. It, those aren't the things that the Lord looks for. Instead, we become God's children when we give our heart to Jesus, to the one who gave his life for us, when we receive his forgiveness and invite his spirit to live in our hearts. It's when we yield our hearts to the Lord to change us, as Romans says. A change of heart produced by the Holy Spirit. Without a changed heart, we're no different than any other religious person. Without a changed heart, we are no different than any other religious person. Or those religious Jews whose father wasn't the Lord. Take this to heart, church, for it's the transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the difference between knowing him and knowing about him. Now, there's another interesting phrase in um, this, this passage. It's verse 10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and that you will suffer persecution for 10 days. That doesn't sound very long. Oh, I can make it through 10 days of anything, right? Is that what he means? Jesus warns them, of course, of the persecution to come. He tells them who the source of this persecution is, the, the devil. And he tells them how long they're going to suffer, 10 days. Again, Revelation is understood only when we connect it back to the big picture uh, found in Scripture. As, as we learned when we studied the book of Acts, if you were with us, we went through the entire book of Acts. And also here in Smyrna, the early church faced waves of persecution. Waves of persecution. And there were actually 10 Roman emperors that were that went after the early church, beginning with Claudius, from he was uh, in reign from 41 to, to 54 AD, Nero, Domitian, Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, Septimus Severus, Max, Maximus, Maximinus, Thrax, I don't know, that I wasn't Greek, um, <laughs> or Roman, De Decius, Decius, Valerian, and that guy. Nice. <laughs> Diocletian? Yeah. Diocletian. Diocletian. So from, and he was, and he was in reign until 3, 305, right before Constantine. So from 41 to 305, all these ten persecuted the Christian church prior to Constantine coming and making the Christian uh, faith a state religion. Now, some of these ten were worse than others, but during their reign, over five million believers were killed for refusing to worship them. Them, the emperors. One famous martyr was a man named Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. John actually appointed Polycarp as bishop of Smyrna. But he was later killed, burned at the stake for refusing to deny Jesus. No wonder Jesus encouraged the believers in Smyrna to be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. 
Incidentally, the Christian church in Smyrna persisted throughout the centuries. You might recall uh, from last week that the Ephesian church lost its light, lost its lampstand, its witness, because they neglected their first love. But the churches in Smyrna and in Philadelphia survived consistently throughout the last couple thousand years. Again, Jesus reminds us this, his, his message is for all of us. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. What's the second death? God's judgment. God's judgment. Those who overcome through suffering, through persecution, through trials and whatever else the devil throws at us will receive a crown of life and not be hurt by God's wrath. This is a message to all believers, to all those who love Jesus as their Lord and Savior, for they, we, are his bride. Everyone else is married to this world, which is actually a good transition to the next church of the seven that we're going to look at, Pergamum. Pergamum. Two root words make up Pergamum. Per, which means by, and gamos, which means marriage, and actually more specifically a mixed marriage. So pergamos, or pergamum, depending on your Bible translation, represents a church married to the world. Jesus tells the church in Pergamum, the, to the angel of the church of Pergamum, right? These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword, which is another description, again, of Jesus who speaks truth and grace. Justice and forgiveness, death and life. Verse 13, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, excuse me, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Lovely encouragement for believers, wouldn't you say? Ephesus was a great political center. Smyrna was a great commercial center. Pergamum was a center of religion and a medicine. And the two were intertwined much more than they are today. Pergamum had temples to several Greek gods like Zeus and Athena and Apollo and the Greek god of medicine, Asclepius. Asclepius. Show you my wonderful slides. I'm missing out here. Great political center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Religion, medicine. Okay. Um, a Selfius held a rod with a snake wrapped around it, uh, which was the forerunner of the caduceus, a symbol of medicine that you might recognize and healing in the medical world today. But neither of these, ironically, were, were original ideas with the Greeks. I don't know if you know this or not. Uh, back in Numbers chapter 21, um, God's people once again complained about God and Moses. So God sent poisonous snakes upon them to discipline them. You kids think your parents are hard on you. Yes. They're sending poisonous snakes to discipline you. God sent poisonous snakes. Uh, I'm not really grateful I was only spanked when I was young. In his mercy, God told Moses, make a brass serpent and, uh, upon a pole, and those that look at it might be healed. In other words, it was another opportunity for them to uh, exercise faith. Okay, I'm, I'm bit by a snake, and, and I need to go and, and look at this snake on a pole, and I'll be healed. There's, there's, a, there's a healing aspect in the pole. But later on, God's people started worshiping it like an idol. Um, so Israel's king Hezekiah destroyed it in 2 Kings 18. All this to say Pergamum was a spiritual center filled with worshipers, but sadly most did not worship Jesus. Now the great altar of Pergamum lorded over the city from an Acropolis 1,000 feet above the city. Scholars believe this is the altar Jesus was referring to when he says Satan's throne in our scripture today. 
So basically what Satan failed to accomplish through persecution of the believers, he tried to do by seduction. Rather than destroying the church from the outside, he worked to degrade the church from the inside. And that's the tragedy of the Pergamum Christian church. Verse 14 says, Nevertheless, ooh, we'll go back. Nevertheless, I've got few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Balaam was a Jewish prophet of God in the Old Testament. But he was, he misunderstood the word prophet. He thought prophet means, means I should make a prophet. He was a prophet for hire. <laughs> Balaam was a, 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 Balak was the king of the Moabites, the enemies of, of Israel. So, so Balak hired Balaam to, to, to get Israel to compromise their faithful obedience to God. So Jesus is criticizing the Pergamum believers for that same duplicity, the same compromising sins. And unlike the Ephesian church, the Pergamum Christians are open about the Nicolaitans' teachings, religious lorded over other types who lack the humility of the Lord. In short, the Pergamum Christians became lukewarm and lazy in their faith, which, if we're honest, we'd also see as a major problem in the American church today. We get a little lazy with our faith. Or a lot. How many attended church on Sunday uh, throughout our country, but, but live as they choose to all week long? How many are spiritual, but not really faithful to Jesus? How many of us occasionally allow compromises here and there, trusting the Lord's grace instead of standing firm in what we know, in what we know? I suspect in some ways this doesn't just impl implicate our society and even our church, uh, our, our very lives. I, I gotta wonder if we ourselves have become lazy to our first love. Fearful in the face of trials and suffering. Weary in our faithfulness. And even in our witness to others. If so, Jesus says, repent. This is Jesus' word to us. Repent. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Repent. Turn around. Start again. I'm so grateful for second chances. And for restarts, aren't you? Proverbs 24, 16 says the godly man, the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. We all fall. We all fall. We all mess up. Question is, do we get back up again? Do we run back to God and seek forgiveness and cleansing from the blood of Jesus? That's the heart of the Lord. Repentance gets a bad rap, doesn't it? But really, repentance is the believer's bar of soap, if you think about it. We get cleansing. When we fail, we can come to the Lord. And we can claim, as 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that beautiful? That's good news. That's God's promise. That's God's heart. The problem isn't with the repenting and confessing. The problem is when we don't. The problem is when we don't. We, we, we hide out. We say, well, I've just done it too many times. I might as well not even go there. Jesus says he'll come fight the false prophets with the sword of his mouth. He'll hammer them with the word of God. Which is your desire for your life? God's forgiveness or God's judgment? That's the choice Jesus is giving to Pergamum. And then again, he says, he who has ear to ear, ear, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of them hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Jesus offers two rewards for those who hear what the Spirit says 
which is more than audibly listening. It's not just hearing, it's heeding, it's accepting, it's receiving, it's taking it to heart, it's obeying what the Spirit says. To those who overcome, Jesus offers hidden manna. Psalm 78, 25 calls manna angel food. Kelly used to call it angel food cake, I like that. God fed the Israelites manna from heaven as they, as they wandered 40 years in the desert. And, and it stopped the moment Jesus led them into the promised land. Isn't that interesting? In this context, Jesus is saying the overcomer will never hunger again. God will satisfy every need. And secondly, the overcomer will receive a white stone with a new and a secret name on it. You know, victors in athletic competitions were often awarded white stones with um, their name inscribed as a ticket to an award celebration. And names were, were often changed in scripture to reflect a new nature of the recipient. For instance, Abram became Abraham the father of nations. Jacob, the deceiver, became Israel. Simon became Peter, the rock. We will receive new names as well. Unique to each one of us, but representing our new life in Christ. Isn't that awesome? Okay, let's stop there for today. Seven messages to the church, each with something to say to us as well. In Ephesus, the message was, remember your first love. Don't neglect your first love. In Smyrna, it's remain faithful, no matter what the cost. And church, as we go into this season, as it continues to unfold, that may get harder and harder. Stay strong in the Lord. To Pergamum, it was remain pure. Don't be deceived. Hold on to the truth. Hold on to the gospel, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, who will return for us soon. Why? Because God's got us, and he has the last word. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for your amazing word, your amazing encouragement, your amazing grace. Thank you so much that we can be your children, your sons and daughters adopted uh, through Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on the cross as we put our faith in him, that your grace through him uh, brings us to you, and you wipe away our sins, and you see us only as you created us to be. Lord, we want to be honoring to you. We want to never neglect you, our first love, Jesus. We want to never uh, be unfaithful. Uh, even though you're faithful all the time, we want to, to be faithful to you and in you, and we need your help to do that. Pour out your spirit upon us every day, and we always want to be pure as well and not deceived Help us hold on to the truth, your truth, as we, as we walk closely with you. I pray over my brothers and sisters, uh, whether they're here or at home. I pray for their families. I pray for our community. I pray, God, that in this trying time, that, God, you would find us faithful as well, loving one another, helping one another, and encouraging one another, because you've got us, and you have the last word. Thank you so much, in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. God bless you.